and thanks for joining us today for our discussion of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I'm Candace Rondeau, and I'm the director of the Future Frontlines Program at New America, a public intelligence service for next generation security and democratic resilience. I think I speak for many, if not most of the world today, uh, when I say that I wish we did not have to be having this discussion. I wish that Ukraine, Russia, and the world was not in such a precarious uh, situation, but here we are uh, on the precipice of um, a new order and also in the middle of probably one of the most devastating conflicts in recent history and in recent memory. Um, even as we meet here today with our colleagues from Civic and Bellingcat, Russian forces continue to press forward into major cities like Kharkiv, Kherson, Kiev, and the scale of civilian harm has been significant. And unfortunately, we may only see this get worse as the fighting continues. Uh, some of you may know that the UN has been releasing different casualty estimates over the last several days. Um, and the estimates uh, are a little bit all over the map, but uh, as recently as yesterday, we saw uh, casualty figures uh, as many as 400 killed so far in six days of fighting, um, and obviously hundreds injured, but even the UN has to acknowledge and has acknowledged that that number is probably low um, and that the scale of, of the harm already has been much, much more significant. And we also know that 500,000 people at least have been displaced by the conflict and the invasion uh, so far, and that many, many more may still come to be displaced uh, as, the, as the fighting continues. Um, this escalation uh, on Russia's part has real consequences, uh, obviously beyond Ukraine, um, for Europe and for the United States and for the world in general. But before we dive into all that and I introduce uh, our panelists, I want to make sure that um, we hear from folks on the ground and most importantly, um, we're so lucky today to be joined by Lisa Baran, the country director for Ukraine uh, for the, the Center for Civilians in Conflict. Um, she has been there for many years. And last time I saw her was just before the pandemic began. Um, and we were living in a different world, but fearing perhaps that this one, this day would come. Um, Lisa, um, I, I know that this has been tough for you, um, but, you know, I also know that this is an important moment for you to tell us what's happening. So thank you for joining us. Maybe give us just a quick debrief from the ground. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Candace, and um, um, thanks for inviting me to, uh, to this event. Um, you know, when I was invited and I was thinking normally people who know me, they know how logical I am. And, you know, like I have very clear talking points in, you know, like, and they're very logical. Uh, canvas to build on, uh, but I think this is the first time in my life and it's um, really difficult. It's just, it's, it's just beyond comprehension what is happening. Um, you know, like we obviously, you know, like as, as a professional at Civic um, and uh, just a normal person, when we saw this escalation starting late last year, um, we, we were doing some scenarios, right? You know, like developing different scenarios. Um, and part of these scenarios was uh, obviously, you know, like to think forward um, about the potential risks to um, civilians, what we are doing in civic protection of civilians, but also we were working on contingency planning for our safety of our staff. And, uh, and I remember all this, you know, like, um, uh, when we were going into the very extreme scenario, we was like, oh, no, it, it will never happen. I mean, it's just crazy. It, it's just, you know, it's just not normal. It just won't happen. And um, at that time, uh, it, you know, like uh, since we had our colleagues pushing us to think through all the scenarios and just to prepare for anything, right? You know, like it's better to be prepared rather than, you know, like going around and thinking what you are doing. Uh, I was... Um, I was moving to my hometown uh, to Ushgara, the western part of Ukraine, the safest place uh, in Ukraine at the at the moment. Um, and um, uh, I just left my car with the keys in, in in the office, just for the very extreme situation. If somebody, if my my colleagues have to flee from Ukraine, and I I was I was one hundred percent sure that it will never ever happen. 
and uh, so I was living this peaceful life in in, in Ushgarad, um when I when I received this call at five a.m. from one of our military officers who we worked with, who said that it started. It's like what started? He's like uh, the airport Burisbal is burning. The Yaveriv um, training center is burning call all your colleagues, uh, they have to be ready to move to go to the shelter or whatever, you know, like go to flee any moment, just call them. I still thought, I, I still couldn't believe that it's happening. I went on the news, you know, like we started calling each other. And basically it took us several hours to make decisions for some people uh, to leave. Uh, luckily, again, my car was there, one of my colleagues was able to collect his whole family, six people in the, you know, like totally, they they, they were jammed in this small Toyota car uh, to flee Kiev uh, with a small child uh, and, and a cat. Uh, some others uh, waited for longer. Uh, I still have one of my colleagues in Kharkiv. Um, she, she was, she's originally from Lugansk. She had to flee in 2014. And then she said that She's not fleeing the second time. This is her homeland, and she's not running away again. Uh, and uh, she, luckily, she sent her children to Dnipro, uh, two, ch two children, with um, excuse me, with uh, the um, evacuation uh, convoy from the state emergency service. Uh, but uh, she she decided to stay with her husband in Kharkiv and. During the first two or three days, they basically didn't come out from the shelter. And she was saying that, you know, like it's such a abnormal life when every morning you you come out, you walk, you walk your dog, uh, you see your neighbors, and then uh, around midday, it all starts, the siren starts, and then everybody's in the shelter just sitting there for, you know, like basically until the next morning. Um, my um, three other, Three other colleagues are still in Kyiv, and we are, you know, like on um, chatting every day. And the only thing I can do is just checking that they are fine, you know, like and and they all these posts like, oh, you know, like there is an explosion. It's really close to me. I mean, I know that it's a coping mechanism that is, you know, like turning on when you cannot be scared all the time. When they start start joking, you know, like oh, they missed the TV tower, you know, like it still stay, it stays, and you know, like it didn't fall, or anything else. But it's just, it's just, it's just insane. Uh, another colleague is not far from Cherkasy, and and she knows that she's stuck there because now she cannot go on the roads. You know, like it's very, you, you, you don't know where you end up with either under an airstrike or a strange checkpoint or these crazy Russians who are uh, killing civilians on the roads. They just killed a uh, shot at a regular civilian bus in, in the Kherson area, Kharkiv area. Um, People are stuck there. Uh, some obviously, you know, like they just don't want move to move because they feel that it would be a surrender and they want to stand up for their um, own uh, hometown. Uh, others are just, you know, like they just don't have any other choice. Um, our colleagues, uh, before the war, uh, we were working with uh, communities along the contact line on uh, civil military uh, dialogues, uh, uh, the community-based protection um, initiatives, and um, we are still in contact with them through Facebook. And they were telling what is going on with their villages there. Some were are just burned down. They are just don't, don't exist anymore. Uh, some uh, are heavily shelled. Uh, there's looting going on. Even the, the, the villages where the Russians came in, they're just looting those houses. They're doing, you know, like, it, 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 they, what they are telling us, they're just full of hatred. Uh, you know, like, it's not, it's not just, you know, like, just go and grab some food. They're, uh, they're doing really crazy stuff to people's houses and their belongings. Uh, there is no, uh, some villages don't have electricity. Um, some villages have very uh, limited mobile connection right now. Uh, in some villages, people just cannot move out because they have immobile parents, uh, relatives, and and there is no obviously because of you know like the hostilities are the fighting is still going on. Uh, there is no way to evacuate them uh, in any ways. Uh, 
and the safe corridors are not um, provided uh, to get uh, people out. Uh, I don't know, I can go on and on and on and on, you know, like uh, when, when this whole thing started, we as civics started tracking civilian casualties. We put together this nice uh, Excel sheet, you know, like monitoring all the news. But yesterday we just realized that we cannot keep up. It's just, you know, like it's just becoming, it's just like a geometric progression, you know, like more and more. And since we are not the organization who does monitoring and triangulation, we just, you know, we just don't have the capacity. It's just becoming huge. It's, and, 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 and the other crazy thing is that um, the, the latest trend is it's clear that they started using civilians and, as human shields. We are having examples when uh, they are using a mental hospital. They, uh, in Chernigov Chirgin, Oblast, they put all the um, patients and the staff in the basement, they locked them, and they put uh, some uh, radar, military, whatever, radar, and then, you know, like our intelligence knows about it, but they are not hitting them because of, you know, like those people, people they don't, you know, they don't want to hurt them. But that's at the deliberate usage of a hospital for their military purposes. Um, another, you know, like there is, I just received a news that in one of the settlements, they are going around with a um, uh, white banner uh, and uh, going to co uh, closer to civilians and they're just shooting at them. As I told you, a civilian bus was uh, shot at uh, today. Uh, they're <clears throat> they're uh, placing um, toys and matches, you know, with explosives. I, I keep, you know, like on these, uh, all the chats where the, uh, the government and the military and everybody supplies, you know, like provide some instructions what to do or not to do. That, you know, like that is coming up all the time recently that don't pick up any things because, you know, like there are explosives there. Or the, the, the new thing is um, they pretend that they are evacuating civilians. They, um, they plan, you know, they put them, I mean, I don't know, uh, I didn't see whether it was true, but uh, our intelligence told us several times and they warned all the civilians to be uh, careful because they're putting on uh, uniforms of Ukrainian, you know, like state emergency service or police or whatever. Uh, and then they pretend that they're doing, you know, like organizing evacuation of people and they plan to, I use them as a shield to with their tank, tanks to come in. I mean, it's it's like they're using the ISIS uh, playbook, you know, like to, to do all these things. And the, and uh, we clearly see that uh, the longer it goes, the more cruel they are becoming. Um, I don't know whether it's related to the fact that all of a sudden they realized that nobody was waiting for them here. Probably something that they were told that, you know, like we will be meeting them here with flowers and happy to see them. Uh, uh, and obviously, you know, like the military officers probably are, you know, like uh, uh, becoming more angry that they cannot fulfill whatever their tasks. I don't know, but it's clearly become really, really bad and devastating. And it's like a, a massive evil, evil, which was, you know, like collecting his power for many, many years. All of a sudden, you know, like the burn burst it out. Um, I don't know, I can, again, you know, like I can go on and on and on and I will I'll leave my colleagues to provide a more logical and, you know, like analytical approach to explain all these things. I just, you know, like I just, I just cannot do it right now, but um, I'm, I'm just proud that Ukraine stands for, um, didn't surrender. I just pray that my colleagues stay safe in Kharkiv and in Kiev. And um, and that tomorrow morning during our regular check-in, you know, like I will see them all again. Sorry. Lisa, thank you. Uh, I know that this is extremely difficult and I wanna thank you, one, for your courage to just even take the time to be with us and talk about what is happening on the ground and give us that perspective. Um, and I can imagine how much pain and stress and fear um, you're, you're coping with, your colleagues are, your family, um, not knowing the answer to what will come tomorrow. Uh, and I really want you to know that we feel that and we're grateful for your, your contributions to this conversation. Let me um, introduce our other colleagues uh, and see if we can open up the conversation a little bit. Um, first, let me introduce uh, Beatrice Godefroy, good friend, longtime friend, 
um, almost almost too much crisis in our lives, isn't it, Beatrice? Um, Beatrice is the director uh, for Europe for the Center on the Civilians of Conflict, and she works very closely with Lisa. She has, of course, been tracking the conflict uh, in Ukraine for, for a very long time, uh, but she also has spent uh, many years on the front lines for uh, leader, leadership positions with Doctors Without Borders, uh, you name it, she has probably been there, some sort of crisis or disaster or another. Um, I also want to introduce Eric Toller, who is a director of research and training at Bellingcat, uh, a collective, an investigative collective that has focused very closely on the conflict in Ukraine for many years, uh, and famously, of course, reported on the downing of the Malaysian airline uh, commercial jet MH17 um, using open source techniques as well as uh, the poisonings of uh, the Scripples and uh, Alexei Navalny more recently. Um, he joins us today uh, from uh, the middle of America. And we're happy to have him here today. I also want to introduce my colleague, Ben Dalton, uh, an open source investigative fellow with the Future Frontlines program. Um, in addition to being a, a proud graduate uh, of NYU's journalism school, just like I am, uh, he also holds a second degree in uh, Russian and Slavic studies. Um, he has reported also from Ukraine uh, on and off for many years. Uh, we also have in common uh, being alumni from International Crisis Group, uh, where we have covered lots of different conflicts around the world. Um, ben most recently worked with me on a story about Russian mercenaries uh, that we have been tracking um, who had signaled that they were planning to, to um, join in the fray in Ukraine early on, uh, a story about the Wagner Group or a contingent of the Wag Wagner Group known as Rusich um, uh, and their, their plans to, to join the fray uh, in Ukraine. So um, really great to have you all on board uh, for this conversation. Um, I wanna, you know, given uh, circumstance and given sort of this, the description that Lisa has given us in terms of the tensions on the ground, the, the challenges for civilians, um, I, I do want to ask, I want to turn to you first, Beatrice, and just sort of uh, open up the floor and talk a little bit about what you think we need to be thinking about in terms of the challenges. Um, there's been talk of, you know, the need to open a humanitarian corridor potentially out of Kiev, potentially out of Kharkiv, Kyrgyzstan, and so forth. What are the prospects and um, what would that mean in terms of, um, you know, civilian protection and, and the challenge there? Well, thank you, Candice, and thank you for inviting us to this conversation. It's obviously very hard to be speaking now from Geneva after Lisa has shared on her experience, and um, that was very strong. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa, for, for taking the time and, and for the courage to do this with us today. Um, so, no, I mean, just to first to reemphasize some of the points that Lisa mentioned. Um, so we've been trying to track just internally as civic, what were the patterns of civilian harm since uh, the, the, the beginning of this, uh, of this attack, of this invasion. And, uh, you know, while on the first couple of days, maybe, or maybe for 36 hours, what we were, you know, um, uh, collecting or tracking was, um, let's say, more instances of uh, collateral damage or incidental harm due to the fact that there was fighting and shelling happening in urban areas. So as we know from previous conflicts, it's indeed situations where, um, uh, based on the types of weapons and the types of tactics that you use, uh, the risk of um, uh, collateral damage or indiscriminate attacks is higher in these environments, but definitely um, starting from, um, let's say, the week, I mean, it's very hard to put dates, but let's say over the weekend, we could see emerge these patterns that, that uh, Lisa was mentioning, which are at a very intense pace. It's very hard to keep track. So in terms also of, you know, what messages to push and to prioritize for us as a, you know, civil society community, there are so many of them at the moment. Uh, and, and Lisa mentioned some of the most acute trends that we're seeing emerge. Some of them, of course, it's very hard to triangulate the information. So some of the examples that Lisa mentioned, we're still you know, trying to understand whether these are risks which are being highlighted by local authorities or which are actual, whether there are actual incidents who have already happened. But definitely this trend of human shield of direct targeting of civilians evacuating um, areas with, uh, you know, under heavy uh, fighting, um, 
as well as uh, booby trapping uh, and, and targeting civilian infrastructure with particular risk to civilians like nuclear sites, for instance, or fuel deposits. These are really trends uh, that we have seen emerge and accelerate in the past few days. Um, and, uh, and, and so this is direct or indirect targeting to civilians. This is unlawful practice and this must stop. Uh, in, in the very immediate uh, way what's what's the main way all of us can can you know try and help civilians at the moment all of us which are not direct humanitarian actors right uh, uh, and so um, I think we should we should put all our strengths and do whatever we can do to 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 try and advocate for these humanitarian corridors to be put in place going in and out of uh, areas where there is intense fighting at the moment should be the top priority for civilians but also for uh, humanitarian actors and, and humanitarian supplies in those uh, areas where there is heavy fighting. Um, for some of them, it's been really hard or impossible to bring in food or essential supplies or medical supplies since already six days. And as the days are going to go, day seven, eight, nine, ten, the, the intensity of, uh, of the gap is going to increase. Uh, so uh, once again, uh, and, and I know this is such a difficult ask, actually, or the difficult thing to, to achieve at the moment, but this is a top priority to improve the protection of the population uh, um, yeah, in those in those areas under under intense fighting at at the moment, um, and um, and and again, I want to insist also on trying to do everything we can to support the evacuation and providing safe routes for civilians, as well as uh, in, improving the let's say, ramping up the capacity to bringing essential humanitarian supplies where they are needed. I would like just to add as well a, a line on, and Lisa mentioned the, 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 the hospital. Um, we have also collected data and have been also reported in the media of ambulances being uh, hit um, and, and medical supplies being hit, medical facilities, sorry, being hit as well. Um, and, and we have seen in the past few years extremely worrying trends on medical facilities, medical staff, medical personnel being uh, targeted or hit in the context of, uh, of uh, urban uh, of war happening in urban areas. And so we should definitely do everything we can to um, advocate for the protection of uh, medical personnel, medical facilities. And I'm, I'm sorry, there's a little bit of noise in the background. So I'll stop here. No worries, no worries. Well, thank you. Uh, listen, I, I think that's right. That we, you know, as a as those who sort of sit at the edge of the humanitarian community, right? Um, I think advocating for, um, you know, opening the lines of uh, for humanitarian assistance is, are, is going to be key. We have to continue to keep up that message and that and the pressure. I am reminded, uh, as as both you and Lisa are talking, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, I've spent too much time studying. Um, sort of Russian military history, uh, you know, and it, I, I fear, unfortunately, we're seeing the replication of some of the tactics uh, that we saw in Afghanistan, you know, um, butterfly uh, mines, I mean, all kinds of things aimed at um, booby trapping, uh, you know, objects that children would pick up, essentially, uh, uh, you know, people who would really be deeply affected for, for the rest of their lives, and it would change a complete generation, right, and we saw that in Afghanistan, um, we've seen that in Chechnya, we've seen that in Syria. Um, these tactics are, um, I guess, just part of the doctrine, uh, even, even if it is not an express doctrine. And, and that is, of course, frightening. I want to turn to Ben because he has, I think, some historical perspective on that to share, uh, as well as just also open it up to Eric uh, to talk a little bit about kind of what, what these tactics mean um, and how we're seeing that kind of that transformation, unfortunately, that translation, I should say, you know, from all these different previous conflicts where uh, Russia has been the chief aggressor. How should we interpret that, Ben? Yeah, um, I'll say that, um, so we've been monitoring for, for months now, a lot of the social media channels associated with, as Candace mentioned, these uh, Russian mercenary groups that are sort of collectively referred to as the Wagner Group, but there's all these various contingents. And, you know, the part that, that I'm seeing now that is maybe the most worrisome on these channels, particularly on places like Telegram, uh, Contact you, um, is a sort of Jekyll and Hyde, like, on the one hand, there's like appeals to 
you know, this imagined sympathetic Ukrainian audience to sort of feed them intelligence. But on the other hand, there's this uh, sort of really bloodthirsty desire for, for uh, punitive measures um, that, that clearly, is, as we heard from, from Lisa, is already being carried out on the civilian population. And, you know, this was signaled well in advance of the invasion. We saw um, there was a intelligence um, report that they were drawing up lists of people who were affiliated with, you know, the government or the Euromaidan revolution. Uh, Putin himself in his speech from, I guess it was just about a week ago, um, just took a, a particularly like punitive tone. Um, I think he, in his mind, is very like sincere when he when he says that he wants to, quote, you know, denazify Ukraine, uh, by which he means, you know, either arrest or, or liquidate um, the, these people that he sees as, as you know, having corrupted the, the country. And now on social media, we're already seeing sort of so far, I think, unconfirmed reports of uh, people going around with lists of, of locals in, in parts of the country that have been under, uh, you know, Russian control. So, yeah, I mean, this feels very reminiscent of what, what uh, took place in, in Chechnya throughout the 90s. Um, this, this goes way back. It sure does. Um, and it's, unfortunately, I think the expression it, it has these echoes of, um, you know, a kind of final solution tone that really is quite scary. But Eric, let me turn to you. Um, you know, uh, yesterday, the um, chief prosecutor for the International Criminal Court uh, Kareem Khan said he was planning to open a new line of investigation. We already know, of course, the ICC, uh, the International Criminal Court, has been um, investigating the downing of MH17, as well as other incidents uh, in and around uh, the Donbass area. Um, but now, you know, he seems to have indicated that this is this is beyond the pale, uh, and that the the invasion calls for a new line of investigation. Um, given your your background, your experience. What are the challenges now that we face with trying to um, develop kind of an evidentiary line, given the extreme scale, the overwhelming scale uh, of just what's happening that Lisa just described? Yeah, and it's um, <clears throat> a lot of the lessons learned from Syria are being adapted here now, um, and also at Yemen, and that um, there's an overwhelming, as you're mentioning, um, amount of information coming in across Ukraine of clear you know, human rights abuses and things that are actionable, I guess you could say, from the ICC's um, perspective. And there's been a big shift in the ICC in the last um, you know, five or so years in that they're now using more or accepting more um, user-generated data to include for their, you know, in, in combination with the things they normally, you know, their bread and butter witness accounts and things like that, they're using a lot more user-generated content coming from um, social media. Um, kind of the landmark case about this that a lot of people um, talk about is um, an arrest warrant was issued for a um, Libyan commander um, a while ago. Who, I think he, I think he's dead now for folly. Um, but um, the basis of the first, there's two warrants put out for him, but the very first one that came out was entirely just based off of Facebook, uh, Facebook posts, because he had um, um, some of his people posted videos of some um, executions that were carried out against alleged ISIS fighters um, outside of Benghazi back um, five or six years ago. Um, so, you know, starting with that, um, with this entire arrest warrant based entirely off of Facebook videos, which obviously could be geolocated and verified and known to be, um, you know, um, something that could be used in court. Um, it's now being, um, it's now a lot more essential because um, you don't have, um, it, you know, witness accounts are, are obviously important for this sort of thing. Um, but the user generated content is, you know, it's literally video from civilians and uh, sometimes participants of the conflict uh, that show exactly what happened, that it could be verified, the place, time, um, location, and so on. So the big challenge right now is often in um, the collection, verification, um, and preservation of this evidence. And there are a handful of people working on this. I know the ICC, they have a lot of mechanisms doing this now. Um, the UN has a bunch of mechanisms within their various um, teams. You know, they don't have a you know, they don't have a team set up as far as I know, um, specifically for, you know, the same way they have for like the, um, the um, triple IM with Syria or the double IMM with Myanmar. As far as I know, they don't have one for Ukraine yet like this. Um, but those mechanisms are in place to specifically to, to gather, verify and preserve this evidence and use it for whatever comes next, um, either now or in the future. So the big challenge right now is with this overwhelming flood of information, this is a, the, the highest level of um, gathering, collecting, uh, verifying, and preserving this stuff. 
um, this is, you know, this is the, you know, the mile high view of how things are going, but from a much lower level of, you know, just stuff you see on social media and the journalists and things like that, stuff that won't be years in the future with, you know, with the history books and with court cases and all that stuff. Um, there's a lot of grassroots efforts going on right now from, um, to, you know, to curate and collect and gather this stuff. We're doing some stuff with Bellingcat. I know other organizations are as well. Um, just to understand the conflict as it's happening right now. Um, so those are kind of the two fronts when you talk about the uh, propagation of user-generated content, kind of the, the grassroots level here of people just trying to understand what's happening and knowing, you know, what's what's actually real, what's just what is older cycle content from 2014 and so on. Um, you know, for example, there, there are two videos, at least two I've seen of, of people throwing Molotov cocktails, you know, from at Russian tanks. And one of them is from 2014 and one of them is recent. They both have five billion views all the time, but you know, they're kind of on equal footing right now. And that stuff is relatively low stakes because honestly, what does it matter if people see those videos? I mean, obviously, you know, we should have clean, you know, information ecosystem, but you know, th there's bigger worries about, right? There's a lot bigger worries right now than um, some fake videos coming out. But um, for the future, for um, again, like the mile high view of, you know, international justice and accountability, um, having um, preserved verified copies of this user-generated user content is stuff that it will be um, thankful that we have um, in the future. So let me let me um, dig into that just a little bit more because I, I do think you know um, there's kind of this balance here between sort of what's happening now on the ground, needing to document it, um, ensuring that there's accountability for lots of different reasons for you know potential reparations for you know civilian harm, all mm -hmm. kinds of reasons why uh, we should be interested in these questions. Um, I remember that during the uh, escalation of the Syrian crisis, uh, you know around 20. 14, 15, uh, there was this real battle to get YouTube um, to preserve some of this information. And yet this is, we're in this very tricky situation uh, where, you know, Russia clearly also considers, uh, you know, the internet to be part of the front. Um, and that, you know, that information is the second front is what I saw on a couple of telegram channels the other day. Um, and so that really complicates matters and I, 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 on a couple of levels, one from a accountability level, but I also want to turn to Lisa here also uh, and, and touch on just sort of the, the psychological impact uh, on Ukrainians of this kind of dual track uh, that we have where you've got information flowing online, um, people are kind of disconnected from each other because they're you know, hunkered down. Lisa, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, like I know that, uh, you know, like sometimes I go into these tears and uh, this is, I'm, I'm, I, I even didn't witness, you know, like probably compared to my, you know, like other, you know, like citizens and our friends and whatever who are in the main part, in the other part of the country, uh, I didn't witness and I didn't experience all this, right? You know, like I was here from the very beginning of this year, I was just working remotely from my hometown here. So when this whole happen thing happened, I was here. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, but the fact that, um, again, as I told you, you know, like I'm in constant, uh, constant contact with my uh, colleagues and it's not just, you know, like chatting, uh, it's just knowing that they are under threat every day. So, you know, like, uh, uh, and um, um, uh, having, uh, in, you know, uh, I was here receiving and uh, hosting several IDP families and hearing to their stories, how they were fleeing, uh, how long, you know, like it took them several days to get uh, out of, you know, to, from, from Kiev up uh, to Uzhgorod because, because of the huge traffic jams, because of the uh, checkpoints. Um, this this uh, family of um, uh, of several military officers, they had to pack uh, uh, six people, three women and and uh, three children in a minivan. And this poor student, I mean, a tender young student, 21 year, like small girl, uh, who barely could drive. She just, you know, like got her driver's license. She would she was put, you know, like to drive this minivan because there was nobody else to, you know, like to take out these women and uh, children out of Kiev. Uh, and they were, you know, like it was the sec the third day already. It's like the the end of the this 
the, probably one of the last batches of you know like people who can still um, move around in the in uh, in the road. Uh, there is no gas uh, on the road. Uh, there, you know, like the the fuel tank is uh, uh, signaling that you know no gas. They are panicking. They are reaching the nearest uh, city, Jitomir, which is they they don't let her, them uh, they, uh, in to the city because there is a signal, the the alarm signal. You know, like airstrike is coming in. It took them several, you know, like like 10, 15 minutes to persuade the checkpoint, you know, that this is the only shelter. I mean, they had a family who, who was uh, ready to host them. So they reached that family. They just grabbed them and took them to the, to the shelter. And that's why they where they spent the whole night. They hit the road the next day was, you know, like some military, luckily, you know, like giving, lending them, I mean, giving them some fuel, you know, like so that they can get at least to the nearest city. And, you know, like, and again, three uh, three days of this type of travel. When, and, and they, you know, like when I told them that, okay, here's the washing machine you can use. It's like, they don't have anything to wash. This is all the only dress we have on us, you know. It's just, uh, and again, you know, like I'm sitting in the safest place in, 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 in the country. I get, I, I can't even imagine what, what other people are going on uh, through right now uh, in Kiev, in Kharkiv and other places where they, I, I have the um, the chat where they're telling us uh, the uh, when the alarm system goes on in each city so that people can see. It's just, it never stops. It never stops. Every every five minutes, there is another alarm, you know, like and people are called to go to shelter here, there, you know, like the whole country now. The whole country except for Transcarpathia. It's I it's I don't know. I you know, like if somebody told me that in the twenty first century this type of war can could happen, I would never I mean, I think nobody believed that it would happen. And 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 uh, what almost forty million people are under all this stress right now. Uh, I yeah, I you know, like the other thing is uh, huge lines on the border crossing, like I, yesterday I was going, you know, like to visit my uh, father in the hospital, and it's that way. It's I don't know. It's at least ten kilometers that that uh, line of the cars, and people are sitting in those cars with children. Again, you know that you know like men are not allowed to go. So these are women and children. Uh, uh, I I'm I'm pretty sure that everybody who went through this will will have this trauma throughout their the rest of their life. Yes, maybe it won't be that painful to talk about, you know, like it hopefully in some period of time. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know how long it will last. Unfortunately, it doesn't turn, it doesn't look like it's just a matter of days or even weeks um, at, at its, as it stands right now. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's, I don't know the, the consequences on the mental health of people. It's just, just devastating. It's just, it's just, you know, just huge. Yeah, the psychological effects have to be huge. Um, living through it, not having the information that you need, being cut off. Um, and I, I, I really, you know, you can say you feel it, but um, I know what you mean. It's, uh, you feel distant from the, the real war, but you are in it, you know, and uh, we all recognize that. Yeah, just to add uh, the, the information flow, you know, from one hand, so what our every day starts with the first days, I, I would wake up at around like 4 a.m. We, we barely slept because of anxiety and because, you know, like we were watching all the news, all the news everywhere, what's happening, what's happening. And and that's another part, you know, like you're in this news the whole day. Uh, you, are not, you, you are looking, you are watching, you are, you know, like so basically you don't have uh, even couple of probably when you are sleeping that's the only time when you are not you know like watching news and not not you know like seeing what's happening around that's another thing uh we i know and probably you know like that's what the psychologists keep telling us on tv that you have to detach you have to go back to your routine whatever but you can't because you know like because you don't know what's you know like what's next and what's what's going on in you know like in this other city so um yeah it's it's just crazy yeah, that, that state of hypervigilance, um, I think, is a big part of living through uh, and, and surviving. Uh, I think many of us uh, still, still cope with that. Beatrice, you wanted to touch on something, too, also about sort of the information warfare piece and how it's affecting folks psychologically 
um, and what we should sort of take away from the impact on civilians. Yeah, no, I mean, just to, to reinforce the fact that, um, I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, that trauma and psychological pressure had started already before the, the, the actual start of the uh, of this invasion. So it's not as if it was happening in a blank sheet. Uh, we had documented uh, at Civic, we produced actually last year a report on protection of civilians and hybrid warfare in Ukraine. And looking at what was the impact of uh, using hybrid warfare, especially information techniques uh, in the context of, uh, of, of, of Ukraine. And, and actually what came out very strongly was psychological harm as a main consequence for civilians of using information warfare. Being, you know, um, tensions being fueled constantly and being exposed to fake news and to not knowing where the situation is going to also manipulation of data on civilian casualties. It was, it was happening before the invasion. And so uh, indeed what we, we see this uh, sort of um, tactics being reinforced like a million times since the beginning of this, uh, of this attack. And, um, and I can imagine how, um, complicated and, and the stress and the trauma it creates also for, for everybody in Ukraine to have to be uh, confronted on, on a, an hourly basis uh, to, this is its information, what is happening? Is this true? Is this not true? Um, and to have to try and double check the information, etc. This is, this. I mean, uncertainty on information is always happening in the midst of this very intense conflict, but in the context of um, um, hybrid and informational war warfare, it's being demultiplied and that's contributing to emphasizing this, uh, yeah, th this trauma. And, and just wanted to get back to some of the really important point that Eric mentioned earlier on um, uh, investigations and, and, and challenges. Um, so first I wanted to thank Ben and Kat for the work they're doing. It's unvaluable. It's very, very important and very useful actually for all of us to try and triangulate some of this information. Uh, also mentioning that indeed before this, this phase of the conflict, uh, OHCHR um, monitoring mission and, 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 and OSCSMM were doing uh, really very important work. Uh, I, I understand that, that, that OHHR may be ramping up their capacity at the moment. It's very important work. Monitoring and uh, investigation in country uh, and let's say fact finding in country should be supported uh, through any means by international community at the moment. Uh, also, there is um, a, 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 um, there's going to be discussions at the Human Rights Council in, in 48 hours on uh, creation of a potential inquiry commission, independent commission for for Ukraine. Uh, let, let's see what what form and shape it should take. But it's uh, typically, yeah, indeed, a context where independent fact finding mission should be um, supported and put in place in order to document what's happening, but also um, work on accountability going forward. Really key. Um, I want to turn to Ben because I know he has quite a few thoughts on this because we've been soaking in this stuff for quite a while. Yeah, so I wanted to say something just to add to that about these telegram groups that we're monitoring that are all, you know, connected in one way or the other to these these uh, private uh, mercenary groups. Um, they are explicitly saying that they're engaging in info war like they actually will use the term they 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 think of themselves as being sort of like on the front line of the info wars and they are these are not small groups either right like many of them have tens and in some cases hundreds of thousands of followers they're like a major part of how you know russian speakers are getting their news about this conflict and we are seeing um you know false, uh, decontextualized, uh, deliberately misleading content that is, that is being posted there. You know, for instance, uh, photos and videos of civilian casualties that, you know, were from years past, or in some cases, like from Syria. Um, so far, like, so back in 2014, 2015, there was this strategy that some of these um, mercenary groups employed, like, so you mentioned Rusich. Um, where they would actually post their own atrocities that they were committing in a way that felt very reminiscent of what ISIS was doing around the same time. And so far, I, I have not seen that on these major channels. They seem to be mostly trying to sort of like paint the, the Ukrainian side as like the ones who are, who are you know, doing all of the evil. Um, but as, you know, they move in, and particularly if this conflict draws out, you know, I would not be surprised if we see a return to sort of this like terrorizing kind of content that was being posted a lot. Um, you know, back in the origins of this war. Yeah, I mean, we have one person in particular who's very well known, uh, Igor, Igor Gurkin, uh, who is now 
you know, basically tweeting from St. Petersburg. And he is, of course, one of the, the progenitors of, of this strategy and this war uh, dating back to 2013, 14. Uh, on the one hand, you know, it, it's important to be able to look into the psychology, uh, the warped psychology of those who are kind of purveying this information war, but at the same time, it's a very delicate balance. Um, we are, you know, only 15 minutes out and we have so many questions here. I wanna make sure we get to the Q&A. Um, and first of all, let me just say, uh, you know, important for you, Lisa, and I think important for the world to understand that there is a lot of passion and emotion and support for Ukraine right now. Uh, and I can see it here in the questions, um, you know, the, the courage and the bravery of the Ukrainian people has been on display for years, but obviously this week in particular, I think has focused the minds of many in the world uh, on sort of like what that actually means and how it manifests. And, uh, and I think it has inspired many. So I just wanna say that uh, and note that uh, as many have here uh, in, our, in our questions. Um, there are a couple of things I think that, uh, you know, to consolidate some of these questions. First, uh, you know, one of the big questions is how can people outside of Ukraine uh, civilians, just everyday folks, how can they help uh, to support, you know, protection for civilians at this stage? What would you recommend? And I'll turn to you, Lisa, and Beatrice, and then uh, then Eric. So one thing is um, that uh, huge support uh, that we are seeing and you know, like I've been working in this humanitarian field for almost 20 years. I worked in Iraq, in Nigeria, in so many countries. And um, yes, I was in crisis, you know, different types of crisis all the time. I was in Baghdad in 2000, but there was 13 when it, there is, you know, like I could hear these explosions all the time, but it was, it was still, you know, like a bit different, right? It wasn't your own country. Behind each explosion, you you didn't expect any of your family members, you know, like to be be hurt or your uh, house, you know, like uh, exploded. So this is, you know, like this is the first time when you're I'm going through this, um, and and um, the amount of messages I personally received from all over the world, you know, like people from Iraq offering me to to move there in their safe space <laughs> right now. I know it's ironic. But this is how you know, like this is a new reality that we are having. Um, so that's that's huge. Uh, this whole support, you know, like on a personal level, on the um, country levels, uh, what we are seeing, the actual uh, things that the countries finally had their courage uh, to introduce sanctions and different other measures. The private companies who are making decisions. Yes, we, these are huge losses. But this is this is one of those things or moments when we have to, to look beyond uh, money. It's just, you know, like the identity. It's, an, it's a totally new world that will be, you know, like um, emerging after, after this war. Uh, so this is huge. And this is something that um, adds to people's uh, courage, um, you know, like to their uh, determination to uh, continue. Uh, and and something that uh, we hope that will just you know like be even more and more uh, as we go. In terms of um, assistance, I think it's very important what Beatrice already said that you know like to call and to make and I don't know how it, it will would be possible, but to put more pressure so that uh, these um, people uh, can be evacuated, provided supplies and um, and. Uh, uh, all they needed so that they can survive basically they are cut off uh, of, of uh, basic you know like uh, um, uh, services and uh, food um, I think you know like it's most probably there won't be hopefully you know like shortage of the items and, and food that uh, the humanitarian organizations can provide but uh, the fact that uh, it's very difficult to do uh, it before because of the fighting in, in most of those places so that's something to very important to look at um and and in terms of um, uh, protection of civilians what you are doing you know like the um, investigations and looking into the actual things and informing the whole world uh about the actual reality because i i took the courage to i have a satellite antenna and to watch the russian news today i could i could I could do it only for like 10, 15 minutes because the reality they are showing, I mean, this is 
it's just you know like so they are liberating us from fascism um that's it that's their narrative so i think it's really important that other organizations provide proof of what exactly what re what is the reality what is going in ukraine and informing the people including russia i don't, i don't know how to get this information to ordinary russians and others you know like but probably there should be something uh, done um, and obviously, you know, like um, we continue our work uh, on the ground. Uh, we have, yes, we, are, we have our, my colleagues hiding in the shelter most of their life, uh, I mean, die, days, um, but, uh, but we continue. We work with our, you know, like civilians that we supported before the war. We continue collecting and talking to them to better understand, you know, like their needs and trying to channel them to the relevant uh, um, organizations um and and hopefully you know like at some point when it, this whole thing stops we can be we will be in a good position to have a really thorough analysis and make sure that you know like in the future nothing i mean at least some of these things don't happen again some lessons beatrice um i'll turn to you and then eric just briefly what, what what is needed right now to, to help uh, with the civilian protection mission? Yeah, thank you, Candice. I mean, Lisa said a lot already, and it's a very, very hard question. Um, but I would say, um, the, of course, the top priority of, at the moment is survival and physical security. Um, so, well, Lisa had said it all in terms of uh, safe passage and corridors and, and, um, and the other top priority which goes with survival is humanitarian supplies, as is mentioned. And um, just going forward, I wanted to reemphasize maybe two, I mean, or just to mention two, two points. I think um, the, so today we've seen that all of us as, you know, humanitarian actors, we've been going through the sideration first, the first few days trying to uh, just care for the safety and security of our staff and progressively let's say since sunday probably monday the humanitarian community is trying to kind of get back to coordinating and scaling up ramping up especially that there are humanitarian needs that can be addressed in host communities uh, in ukraine but also out of ukraine in, in uh, neighboring countries but the, the paradox and the challenge is that um, the assistance can be available in those areas, but cannot be available in the other area where we cannot step a foot outside at the moment. And when I say we, it's not only civic, it's literally everybody apart from very, very few occasions where some of us, uh, you know, INGOs, we can put a step out. So today, who is responding? It's the military civil administration, the state emergency services. So I think um, very immediately, um, the very next steps at the tactical level, so to say, for the ground level for us is gonna be how can we support these efforts because these are the ones which who are the responders today. And, uh, and it's gonna be to try and, and tune into their network and their needs and their, their capacity gaps at the moment and, and support them the best that we can. Yeah. I mean, I was, as you were as you were talking, I was thinking about uh, President Zelensky's, uh, you know, kind of Churchillian moment. You know, we, I don't need to ride; I need ammunition. But we also clearly need something more than just ammunition at this stage. Um, we're moving into a different phase of the war, um, and we need, you know, supplies, medical supplies. We need uh, food. We need, you know, warm clothing. We need uh, this kind of assistance, and it needs to come now. I also want to, uh, you know, raise an issue just as uh, one of the few uh, people of color out here who's actually like reporting uh, in crisis zones around the world um, that there are a lot of Africans and Middle Easterners who have, you know, traveled to Ukraine to go to university and because it is it's a wonderful educational system there uh, and so many resources available, people from all over the world. I remember that very distinctly, uh, spending time in Kiev, how many Nigerians and Sudanese and Somalis um, and now here they are struggling to get out uh, at the border uh, and they're being turned away or being pushed to the back of the line as if they were not human beings. Um, so I just want to point out that there's this kind of strange dichotomy that we find ourselves in yet again uh, when it comes to European policies on, uh, on uh, refugees and asylees uh, and that, that needs to change immediately as well. Um, Eric, uh, there's a question here. Uh, I'll turn to you on this. Uh, you know, we have 
you know, as we were mentioning before, we've seen this movie before in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. Um, what, and we've also seen even, you know, during the most recent uh, phase of the conflict in Donbass before the invasion, uh, we've seen foreign fighters come in and kind of change the calculus on the ground. Uh, and, we, and we know that uh, Russia likes to use that oftentimes as a kind of, as a justification for even more cruelty in the, in the battlefield. What do you anticipate, Eric, in, in terms of that? Do you mean foreign fighters coming in to fight the side of Ukraine? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to say because there's been a huge influx of people interested in coming to fight um, on the side of Ukraine. And we saw this in, obviously in 2014 um, with a lot of them. They, the only places for them to join were the far right groups like uh, Right Sector, Azov, you know, the ones that everyone knows about, C14. Um, and, you know, some of these people who were joining were, you know, far right, you know, fascist, white supremacists, whatever, who um, fit in um, relatively nicely with some of the more fringe elements within those groups. But other people were just people who, you know, were veterans who just, um, I don't know, who just like to fight for whatever reason. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a mixed group. Um, now the group, you're seeing the similar thing right now. Um, but the thing is, is um, Ukraine is taking everyone in and they're not, you know, um, cordoning them off into these more French groups that are just um, right, you know, down in, you know, Sector M down by Mariupol and stuff like before, um, like in 2014 and 15. So, yeah, it's, it's fascinating to see how, I mean, fascinating in the most terrible way of uh, how um, Russia could respond to these things, because you've seen how they've responded to, um, you know, um, Western weaponry and munitions and stuff coming in and just saying the entire, you know, the entire country is Western and NATO because they get, you know, bullets from Bulgaria or, uh, you know, guns from Lithuania or whatever. Um, and there are a lot of fighters coming in from all over. Um, there have been some very unconfirmed, very shady reports about American far right groups sending people in, though I think a lot of that is just kind of big talk rather than a follow through. They'll probably, some people will come through, right? But for every 100 proud boy, proud boy who talks about going to fight in Ukraine, maybe one will actually go through, maybe. He'll probably get stuck on, um, in Germany or something on his way over. Um, and a lot of people coming over and but even more so i think it's maybe more interesting is you're hearing tons and tons of reports about you ex ukrainian expats who are coming back home to take up and to fight you you, you hear a million anecdotal stories um online and you know i've heard myself from you know people who are working in poland or the uk or spain or whatever and then they just they're just leaving they're dropping everything and they're going back home to fight um so it's not people coming in the fight aren't just foreign fighters you know either the, the kind of the wacko weirdos who are coming to fight who maybe were previously fighting in syria and you know who knows what they have going on back home um the re relatively normal again relatively is doing a lot of work because if you're going to fight abroad you're um you're kind of a strange person probably in one way or the other um like the french legion that sort of thing and then you have people just coming home um fighting um either people who are ukrainian or have ukrainian heritage um and that's a probably those people are probably outnumber the foreign fighters who are coming in so it's worth thinking about those as well so uh, could this be used as justification for you know more cruelty and more targeting of civilian infrastructure and all that? I mean, maybe. I mean, Russia doesn't really need an excuse to do that. They're going to do it and then make up an excuse afterwards, right? So I don't think that I don't think that, that what they're doing there really matters because they're going to do what they're going to do and they'll, you know, make up a reason later to justify it. If it's not this, it'll be something else. Um, but, um, but no, it'll it'll be um, um, interesting to see exactly who who actually makes it over there and how um, and how Ukraine organizes these influx of fighters, whether it's you know, a hundred or a thousand, or or if you count in people coming home for expats, tens of thousands. You know, I, I will note on the Russian side, um, you know, this is, I guess, we, we, we tend to sort of monitor the other side of the white supremacist movement, uh, where we've been looking at the Russian imperial movement, the Legion, the Partisans, uh, Rusich, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, the nexus between these organizations and Adam Waffen Division is very well known. Uh, the base as well, obviously, uh, you know, uh, Ronaldo Zaro is still in St. Petersburg, as far as we know, uh, pot potentially maybe he's now made a, made a decision to, to join the fray in Ukraine. Um, so what's, what's interesting about this, I think, is uh, you have kind of ethnic motivations uh, of all kinds that are drawing people into the conflict. Um, and weirdly, sort of unlike Syria or, you know, uh, or even Afghanistan, where you have foreign fighters, um, you see a lot more empathy uh, from Europeans, from Americans, for um, those folks who are joining the fray. I was born and raised in Chicago, 
lived in a Ukrainian village. Um, I, I can imagine now the conversations that are going on there and, and the tough choices that people are also making um, because many people still have you know, family ties and uh, it's, it's a difficult situation that I think we find ourselves in. Uh, unfortunately, we are at time. Uh, there is probably like a million more things we could discuss right now. Uh, and I know that we will be having this conversation again. First, let me just thank Lisa one more time. Uh, thank you for staying with us, for being with us, for your courage. Um, Slava Ukraine. Slava Ukraine. Uh, let's hope for uh, better days ahead. And uh, thank you, Eric, Ben, Beatrice, for being with us. And thank you to the audience for your very thoughtful questions. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid to say it, but we probably will be back here again uh, and we'll see you soon. Thanks.